GT Holidays, South India's number one travel brand. Govi, a vernacular edutech brand, skilling everyone everywhere. Hello and welcome to Galata Plus. In this video review episode, we are going to be taking a look at Chidambaram's Manual Boys. This film is a solid, efficient survival story told in broad strokes. Flaws and all, the high moments work. Now, this is based on a real life incident and it is set in 2006. This is the story of a group of friends that went to the Guna Caves where the super hit Ele Raja song Kanmani Anbodu was shot. Another snatch of a Kamal Hassan Ele Raja song Anna Tadarar plays en route in Parani. Now, upon reaching the caves, one of this group falls into a deep pit. And while the locals say the guy is a goner, the friends refuse to lose faith. They came as a group, they will leave as a group. This is thus as much a survival drama as the story of undying friendship. Manual Boys can be compared to that other smash hit survival drama 2018. It is written in very broad strokes. For instance, it is not enough that a man is trapped in a pit. We also get horror stories about local beliefs about the pit nicknamed Devil's Kitchen. These stories are necessary, sure, but they are not narrated casually. They are shot in an ultra dramatic manner that hammers home extra layers of the dangers involved in case we miss it. It's not enough that the shell-shocked friends rush to a police station for help. There has to be a cop in there who brandishes a stick and threatens to file an FIR on them for killing their friend and trying to pass the act off as an accident. Sushin Sham's unabashedly big score, solo, violin and all, underlines the bigness of the telling. There are many individual moments that work. Sobin Shahid plays Kutan, one of the oldest men in the group. As he descends into the jagged pit, we see just how dangerous the fall must have been for the man who actually fell. There is an exquisitely poetic stretch that shows the friends as young boys playing hide and seek, which is the very game that will later be played out at the Guna cave. As the young boys keep playing, the sunlit bright yellow frames of Manumel transform to the chilly blues of Kodekanal. The reason this stretch works so well is that it points to two things. One, the fact that someone is always getting into trouble and the others have to help him out. And two, we get a psychological portrait of a dream state. But when the second childhood flashback occurs, it's redundant. It feels like the film is being padded out. In other words, we get a lot of very uneven writing, but the high moments really deliver such a high that most people may not care about what doesn't work. I didn't care, for instance, for the frequent cutaways to the larger rock formations and hills. While these images reinforce the bigness of nature and our smallness in comparison, and also reinforce how dangerous this setting is, we keep getting distanced from the claustrophobia of the cave situation. The sentimental ending too goes on and on much after the rescue to hammer home the heroic nature of the hero. It is not enough that the man does a heroic deed until the entire township acknowledges it and celebrates it. But the real heroes of the film are production designer Ajay and Chaliseri and cinematographer Shaiju Khalid. You don't know where the sets end and where the real settings take over. It's brilliant. And the visuals just have that balance of docudrama and cinematic drama. If the idea was to convey the fact that this really happened, then mission accomplished. The screenplay is always playing to the audience. It believes in big, very obvious setups as opposed to the smaller, more invisible setups in something like Premalu. I'm talking about that unexpected payoff like the bit about the pepper spray in that film. But here in this film, that is in Manual Boys, the big setups are calculated to make you anticipate the payoffs as opposed to the payoffs taking us by surprise. A man sees a piece of news in a torn bit of a newspaper and his face fills up with an expression that makes the audience go, what on earth did he read in that piece of newspaper? And the payoff happens at the very end. Another setup involves a very pointed conversation about God, who is described as a light from above. And we get this very image, a light from above, as a payoff. Why not have a more rambling conversation amongst all the friends, a conversation that happens to include God as opposed to a two-line exchange that is specifically about God as a setup and that too with the very person who is going to be reminded of God. That way, we get more interaction between this bunch. We'd also get a setup that's more disguised. And why sentimentalized the rescued man as a God? Because he has come back from the dead. This is the kind of bad, gallery-pleasing melodrama 
that you expect in Tamil cinema, not Malayalam cinema. But there's no denying the mechanical efficiency of the end result of this chain of setups and payoffs. When the lights from above moment happens, when that goose fleshy tug of war moment happens, when the very specific lines from the Gunnar song play at the end of the ordeal, no spoiler alert there, it works, it totally works. The rescue operation ends with an image that left me with tears. Sabin Shahir is always marvelous and here he has a way of embodying the ordinary with minimal fuss even when his character is facing the most extraordinary situations. But the other actors don't register much because they're presented as a collective with a trait here, a trait there. For instance, at a wedding, Kutan is the one who serves people their meals. He's the helper while his friend won't even serve water because he doesn't want his clothes to get stained. Srinath Bhasi plays the reckless one. We instantly know his fate. Because of this very pointed one trait per person writing, the interpersonal relationships don't come across well. And I was reminded of Sudani from Nigeria where the bromance elements were far more convincing and far more moving. I wondered if for narrative clarity alone, the number of people in the group could have been reduced because at least half this group ends up contributing very little to the proceedings. The most moving portion involving this group is the subtext. These are very ordinary men in very ordinary jobs. They are house painters, cab drivers, assistants in optometrist shops. They are single and these occasional trips are the highlights of their lives. The inclusion of the Guna song is thus a masterstroke. It's not just that the song was shot in the location where most of this movie takes place. It's also that the all-consuming, almost divine flavor of romance in the song applies to this all-consuming, almost divine bromance between these men. That is why, despite its many flaws, Manuel Boy's works. I saw the film as a larger metaphor for the Malayalam film industry. If you've noticed, their movies always have the longest thank you card stretches in Indian cinema. Unlike in other industries where stars and technicians operate on their own, the people working in Malayalam cinema come across like a brotherhood, like their own version of Manuel Boy's. In this film alone, we see Khalid Rahman, the director of the gorgeous Anuraga Karikin Vellam, and Tallumala, Unda and love. He plays a supporting part and his brother is this film's cinematographer. The director of Driving License, Lal Jr. is another supporting actor here. The sense of camaraderie that exists in the Monumental Boys, that sense seems to exist in the industry too. And that's why whether individual films work or not, the industry as a whole is thriving. That Guna song perhaps is an ode to this industry, which comes across as a fraternity in the truest sense of the word. And that's it about Manual Boys. If you like this video review, do subscribe to Galata Plus and see you soon at the movies. GT Holidays, South India's number one travel brand. Govi, a vernacular edutech brand, skilling everyone everywhere.